Land's End, they call it. But for millions who have come to Britain on business or just to visit us, it is land's beginning, the most westerly point of that little group of islands which was called Britain even before the English came here. Little, yes. Nowhere in Britain is more than a few hours from the sea, and yet nowhere in the world, perhaps, is there so much variety in so little space, so many things going on. It's literally true that whatever your interests, you'll find something to suit them near at hand. Where better to start than a mere three miles from Land's End itself? Here, on the granite cliffs of Porthcurno, the Minnock players prepare to stage one of our greatest plays, Shakespeare's Macbeth, on what must surely be one of the loveliest theatres in the world. The Minnock Open Air Theatre is rapidly becoming one of the highlights of any visit to Cornwall. Built in 1932 and enlarged over the years, the theatre is used throughout the summer season by theatre groups from many parts of the country. The stone table was found some years ago for an amateur production of Tristan of Cornwall and left for others to use. At such a table, it's easy to believe that Banquo's ghost might rarely appear. And Shakespeare, what would he have said to see his battles fought and hear his poetry spoken in this green amphitheater on the Cornish cliffs. He would have been content. For in the words of that earlier Tudor dramatist, John Haywood, the world's a theater, the earth a stage, which God and nature do with actors fill. And nowhere do those lines have more meaning than here on the rocks of England's western tip. Shakespeare's multitudinous seas pound the deep cliffs, but the land of Shakespeare has many waters, not all of them turbulent. Nothing could be gentler than the waters of his own River Avon at Stratford, where every year on April the 26th, his birthday is celebrated with full civic dignity. Civic, yet international, for every year the representatives of some 90 nations follow the mayor and councillors of Stratford-upon-Avon on the pilgrimage to the half-timbered house where the poet was born, four centuries ago. From the days of Elizabeth I to those of Elizabeth II, and to Westminster, where both Elizabeths have reigned. Here is the young queen arriving for one of the most colorful of London's events, trooping the color. This ceremony has its roots in the distant past, before Britain had a standing army. In those days, the regimental color was the rallying point. A regiment, however brave, could become a leaderless rebel. So, morning and evening, the color was borne through the ranks while every soldier memorized it. This was called trooping the color, and though its original purpose has long been outgrown, the tradition has become a focal point of regimental pride in the Brigade of Guards. Each year, a different battalion of this famous brigade has the honor of trooping its color before the sovereign. Five regiments make up the Brigade of Guards, the Grenadiers, the Coldstreams, the Scots, the Irish, and the Welsh Guards. Their scarlet tunics and towering bearskins are part of the London scene, and theirs is the proud duty of guarding the Sovereign's residence. The full magnificence of trooping the colour may be seen only once a year in high summer, but every day hundreds of people from many lands watch the smaller but still brilliant parade of changing the guard at Buckingham Palace. 
the guard's ceremonial drill is second to none in the world. To end the trooping, the quick march past as Her Majesty takes the salute. Trooping the colour takes place on Horse Guards Parade, home ground of the Household Cavalry, the Sovereign's personal bodyguard. They take little part in the trooping itself, for this is an infantry occasion. Their main duty is to escort the Sovereign between the palace and the parade, as they do for all state events. From glittering cavalry to more workaday animals. Here, for example, is the agricultural show at Oswestry, in Shropshire, one of the lovely English counties bordering Wales. Here, too, the delightful variety of British life can be seen. For typically, the average British farm is a mixed one. Not in Britain can you drive hundreds of miles, as you can in other countries, seeing nothing but cattle or nothing but sheep. In most parts, you may see every animal and every crop known to farming in a day's walk. quality of British livestock is sought by buyers from all over the world. Many agricultural shows take place throughout the length and breadth of the country in summer and autumn. This particular show dates back to 1862, but many are far older, harking back to the great fairs of feudal times. Though, of course, in the modern economy, their function has greatly changed. Still, the continuity is unbroken, and these are the descendants of the men and of the animals who trod the earth of England when Chaucer was alive. They have drawn on the finest stock of other lands, made it their own, and in turn enriched other lands with it. Another occasion, sporting this time, which is thoroughly English in atmosphere, and yet as international as the United Nations, Wimbledon fortnight. The All England Lawn Tennis Club at Wimbledon about half an hour by train from the centre of London, was the birthplace of lawn tennis as a serious sport. It began on a mere handful of courts and has grown to the present world-famous site, clustering round the centre court where great names have battled for great titles over half a century. Great names. But there is also something delightfully informal about Wimbledon. The star players have no private entrance. They arrive among the crowd where everybody has a chance to see them. Tea gardens, indoor cafes, and outdoor refreshment bars give you a chance to relax and to look at the fashions. For Wimbledon, informal as ever, is both a fashion parade and a place where you can wear what you like without being frowned on. If you haven't a centre court ticket, there are plenty of other matches going on, and the programme so crowded that even the mightiest stars have to play on several courts during the time of the tournaments. One reason for the popularity of tennis is that, like Britain, which gave it birth, it is so varied. Singles and doubles, men's, women's and mixed, all the same game in theory, but all so different in tactics and spectator interest. And the crowd's always worth looking at, too.
there's a sporting event for a change which is in no sense international, though visitors come from many lands to watch it. The Bremar Gathering, not far from the Royal Castle of Balmoral in Scotland. It's always a royal event, and rightly too, for Britain's royal house is as Scottish as it is English. The first king to rule over both lands was James Stuart, who was King of Scotland before he was King of England. And our present queen has a Scottish mother. So here, among the pipers and dancers of her mother's land, she is thoroughly at home. Some events at the Bremar gathering, like the tug of war, are recognizable to Sassanachs, as the Scots call the English. Though even the tug of war seems to look different in the kilt. That handsome dress whose pattern signifies the clan, the district, or perhaps the regiment of the wearer. The kilt might have been designed to give added grace to the sport of throwing the hammer. This item is purely Scottish, tossing the cabber, a sport for giants. And they breed giants in the Highlands, as you can see. The distance doesn't count. The object is, by skill and strength, to make the cabber fall away from you and not back towards you. Try it sometime. But buy yourself a kilt first. It looks all wrong in shorts. Back to England, to what is, for millions, the biggest sporting day of the year, the Cup Final at Wembley in northwest London, where the two surviving teams from many weeks of elimination rounds meet to decide the English soccer championship. And this is Aston Villa, in the striped shirts, playing Manchester United. One up to Aston Villa, and now watch the second. Manchester United were odds-on favourites for this particular cup final because they were already league champions. That is, they'd scored the highest number of points during the season's matches in the high-powered first division. But it's a very rare thing for a team to pull off the double, the league championship and the cup. And this time, Aston Villa were too strong for them. Villa became the first team in history to win the cup seven times. Needless to say, the battle for the most coveted trophy in the soccer world is also a royal occasion. The biggest sporting day of the year? The steeplechase fans wouldn't agree. Their vote, and quite a lot of their money, certainly goes to the Grand National at Aintree near Liverpool. The race where anything can happen, and usually does. It's a big day for the bookies, too. But in the Grand National, the favourite seldom wins, even when the punters have made up their minds who the favourite is. Well, it's all the more fun for that. Now's the time for a last-minute choice as the field parades round the paddock. Even if you're an expert, your guess is as good as mine. which may change the whole picture. Many a proud favourite has come to grief at the first jump, and many others have led all the way to fall at the last, or even on one famous occasion a few yards from the post. one of the best races for the spectator. Wherever you sit round the big course at entry, there is drama all the way. The 
last few jumps, what's left of the field is thundering towards the finish of another Grand National. Surely the most exciting event in the racing calendar. Or perhaps you prefer your racing with the horsepower measured in hundreds. Aintree is an important car racing track too. On this occasion, the one chosen for the European Grand Prix. Yes, you're right, that's the Duke of Kent. Britain has made great advances in recent years in this thrilling sport. British drivers like Moss, Collins, Hawthorne and Brooks have been battling their way to the top. So the tracks where these men and machines race on their home ground, Silverstone, Aintree, Goodwood, are gaining in popularity year by year. the checkered flag and now how about something older and odder machinery has been part of everyday life in Britain for more than a century longer than anywhere else in the world long enough for its earlier examples to appeal to the Englishman's passionate interest in antiques these iron veterans are taking part in shall we call it a mechanico social occasion which has become popular in the last year or two a traction engine rally at Elam in Kent a small village within a few miles of the southeast coast. To be quite fair, these traction engines may be antiques, but they're hard-working antiques. Though most of them were built at the beginning of the century, and a couple as long ago as the 1880s, some of them are still used on farms today for jobs like pulling down trees and towing them to sawmills. They seldom rate at more than eight horsepower, but they were built to last. And even the ones which no longer do a day's work are at least good for a day's play. Back to the up-to-date machines, and to a part of the British Isles we haven't visited so far, Northern Ireland. This is the Ulster Grand Prix, one of the major events of the motorcycle racing world, which attracts entries from many countries. This is another sport in which British stars have achieved international fame. Names like Duke and Surtees rank as high in the two-wheeled game as do Moss and Collins in the four-wheeled. If motorcycle racing appeals to you, bear in mind another great British occasion, the tourist trophy fortnight in the Isle of Man. Both the Ulster and the Manx meetings compare with any in the world for sheer excitement. Over the line for a wonderful finish. And now, how about something quieter? But in its own sphere, just as famous, a Welsh Eisteddfod. Local, national, and international Aesthephalae attract big audiences in this land of song. Wales is perhaps the most musical country in the world. It is also one with traditions stretching back into prehistory, but its people were here long before the Anglo-Saxons came. And an Aesthephod, with its strange mixture of folk music, classical music, and ancient ceremony, is unlike anything else. No wonder visitors from many lands, whether they come to watch or listen, or to contribute something of their own country's music, return year after year. And here's something else, back in England this time, which began as a local event and has become international. Henley Royal Regatta on the Thames, upstream from London. It was established by a town hall meeting in 1839, which decided on the holding of, to quote, an annual regatta under judicious and respectable management, which would be a source of amusement and gratification to the neighborhood and to the public in general. 
the public were obviously both amused and gratified. And by that strange evolution which operates in the sporting world, Henley, in due course, took its place with Wimbledon, Epsom and Cowes among the list of otherwise ordinary small towns which have become international meccas of their own particular pastime. Americans, Russians, Dutchmen, French, college crews, army crews, club crews, eights, fours, pairs, skulls, they all come to Henley to pit their skill against the British oarsmen and each other. The people who attended that meeting in 1839 cannot have known what they were starting. If they could see their regatta now, they would be perhaps amused, but certainly gratified. mentioned Cowes just now, a town on the coast of the Isle of Wight, which is to yachting what Henley-on-Thames is to rowing. During Cowes Week, it's the mecca of yachtsmen from all the seven seas. Each day, a regatta is organized by a different yacht club, so that every type of sailing vessel has its chance. And with the tremendous growth in the popularity of sailing since the war, the many classes of small craft which are designed to suit every man's purse have gained in importance. But perhaps the most glamorous event is still the classic contest organized by the Royal Ocean Racing Club, the 605 mile fastnet race, the most exacting test of all for yachts and their crews, particularly if the weather forecast is on the stormy side. Strong to gale force winds put a stop to racing for the smaller classes, but the ocean racers are big and tough with crews to match. And for them, a falling glass is just an added challenge. Everything is ready, and the Royal Yacht Squadron's cannon signal the start of the race. Even our cameras are in for a rough trip. In the fast net race, vessels are handicapped according to their size in three classes. But altogether, 41 yachts representing six countries are off to a good start. It may look dangerous going, but the yachts have been designed and built for it. And it's a tribute to their quality and that of their crews that in the quarter of a century's history of the Royal Ocean Racing Club, only one life has been lost in this type of race. The race lasts about a week, but in these conditions, every day sees one or two yachts having to drop out. In the race you're watching now, only 12 of the original 41 held on to the finish. If their luck is out, well, there's always next year. Racing finished, the yachtsmen celebrate. For they're sociable people, and Cow's Week is a great social occasion, helped not a little by the active interest of the Duke of Edinburgh, who is a regular and skillful competitor. Royal events, local events, occasions great and small, within the few hundred miles that compass Britain, there is limitless variety throughout the year and in every season of the year. No one need travel far to find something to capture his interest. For Britain is the country where there is always something happening.